right, hello everybody. We're just letting you all in now. Right, so we'll be along in just a minute. Uh, let me know if the sound, oh, here we are, the sound isn't uh, working for you. We'll be... Okay. I think we'll start now, if we might. We seem to have, I'm just looking at my colleague Fiona, yeah. Uh, we've got the first lot of people through, we're looking forward to the talk very much, and this time round, we are delighted to have James Rawling with us. Uh, James curated the, well, we spoke to James originally at the end of 2019, way before the pandemic. Um, James is a specialist in 20th century British art, uh, he's an art advisor now, but was previously Head of Modern British Art at Sotheby's. And at the time, in a fairly straightforward way, we asked James to curate an exhibition of landscapes from the Jerwood collection. And we had the idea of three sections of coast, countryside and city images. The lead work for our exhibition was Edward Borden's print of Brighton Pier. And really that was as far as we got in our thinking. And so, James, I'm going to ask, uh, could you perhaps just talk a bit about how you started to think about selecting works for the exhibition? Um, well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, the, the the selection process really, I suppose, it, ta it, it ta you go along step by step. And once we got that idea that we were going to look at landscape work, we were then going to sort of try and subdivide that down a little bit to look at how the um, those three topics of coast, country, and city were were dealt with. It was then a case of looking at the looking at the collection and looking at what the works in the collection were that might really. Okay, I think we'll start now, if we might, we seem to have it, I'm just looking at my colleague Fiona, yeah, uh, we've got the first lot of people through, we're looking forward to the talk very much, and this time round, we are delighted to have James Rawling with us, uh, James curated the, well, we spoke to James originally at the end of 2019, way before the pandemic, um, James is a specialist in 20th century British art, uh, he's an art advisor now, but was previously head modern British art at Sotheby's. And at the time, in a fairly straightforward way, we asked James to create a bit of landscape from the Derwood collection. And we had the idea of three sections of coast, countryside, and city images. The lead work for our exhibition was Edward Borden's print of right of here. And really, that was as far as we got in our thinking. And so, James, I'm going to ask, uh, could you perhaps just talk a bit about how you started to think about selecting work for the exhibition? Um, well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, the, the, the selection process really, I suppose, it, 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 you go along step by step. And once we got that idea that we were going to look at landscape work, we were then going to sort of try and subdivide that down a little bit to look at how the, um, the three topics of coast, country and city were, were dealt with. It was then a case of looking at the, looking at the collection and looking at what work in the collection were that might and um, moved it along. As you visit the exhibition and see things, it should give you, um, you know, yes, it's nice to be able to recognise an image or something like that, but um, just to be able to jump away in your own mind and um, take something home from it. We, um, we, we then found ourselves with a sort of rather um, uh, sort of tricky period uh, in um, early part of 2020. Uh, so everything. Closed. It seems like everywhere were 
not going to be open, people were not going to be, have exhibitions to go to. And of course, we were going to find ourselves, um, we were going to find ourselves really in this hinterland where we didn't really know what was going to happen and when. So we had to think about, firstly, carry on planning for the exhibition, if you're planning ahead of yourself, but it was to think about what was happening at the time. It occurred to me to um, really to start to ponder that idea of was what was happening was all going to actually have any bearing on how we viewed pictures which were all obviously from a different time before them. I think that's obviously an idea that really connects with visitors because I can say that this exhibition has been hugely successful and engaging with visitors. Mm. So it's certainly very timely. Mm. And as I said, we started uh, thinking of the show just with the Edward Gordon uh, mm. and Pier mm. image in mind. And I just wonder, with the, having lived through the mm. pandemic, do your thoughts change about that image or have, they, have, it, have it changed how you did that particular work? I think it's, uh, yeah, I think there are certain things that over the last year or so we've all started to look at you know events and places particularly places where people gather in a slightly different way, way because we've, we've had to, we've had to either through the regulations that have been in place or really through your own sense of self, self-preservation and i mean the image that kicked this idea off really was the one we just had screens before which was by james Hitton. because obviously when you're putting an exhibition together one of the things that um is always key is you know, when does it start when does it finish and when it starts in the past, we've always had a uh, private view, and I just remember looking at that image, just thinking, "Well, we're never going to have one of those again," you know, because it's everybody's acting, looking at pictures, having a drink and a chat, and you know, that sort of event suddenly in the early part of last year felt like a completely alien concept, and that was one that started thinking about it. And then, of course, once we then started to look at the list that we'd been building up of images, and if we if we show the Brighton Pier mm. image now, you know, it's something that this was always a picture that we felt was a key image to have in the show because it marks that very distinctive difference between the land and the sea it's at right at that point the, the pier going out into the sea it's where the seaside happens and you know the idea of a pier it's a very victorian idea this sort of rather wonderfully show offy slightly um you know slightly ornate and rather uh, but rather exciting feel of a seaside pier. It's, it is the epitome of that kind of entertainment. Um, and this felt a perfect image of that. But at the same time, it struck me as rather poignant that, of course, in this one, yeah, there's, it's all there in its, fine, in its finery, but there's no people. And uh, yeah, you know, that, that's it. that seemed very, very much of the moment. Uh, uh, completely. Um, of course, you look at it now, and it does feel very poignant because... Mm. I think we all remember images of previously crowded places on you. Well, that's that's exactly it. And I mean, I think, you know, in the, in the summer, we'll all remember that in the summer last year, we were seeing images in the newspapers of a crowded beach when at the point when everybody could go to a beach and it was being held up as something that was, uh, well, isn't this terrible? Look at everybody on the beach. Whereas prior to that, it would have been, look at everybody having a great time on the beach. And um, yeah. so that sort of shift in how we perceived exactly the same thing. Um, did strike me as an interesting, uh, an interesting idea. So moving on to your next, uh, one of the next images, um, sort of same scene, very different treatment. Can you talk mm. a bit about this this picture? Well, we were we were keen to try and look at the pictures in the collection, and find ways that you could see how artists had approached a similar topic, but from totally different viewpoints. So. With Borden, you're on the land looking out towards the pier, out to sea. Here, you've Piper's taking you the other way around. This is very much an inward-looking image. And it also shows you something of the, the time in which it was made, this idea of a very intentional, kind of homemade, rather rough feel to it is something that is very much, uh, it's very much key to British art in the 1930s. And when we look at look at, our, at artists like Ben Nicholson and Alfred Wallace, and you know, there's that wonderful feeling of it being something that you have made. And I love, I have always loved the idea in this one of the um, that the cliffs are made of of newsprint, um, and just using that very everyday object and material to give this sort of wonderful sense of a place. Mm. So again, another similar uh, same scene of a beach, but again, a very different treatment um, mm. is the John Tonnard um, beach scene, which mm. I think we're going to look at next. And it's not an image uh, 
I knew at all. And I find it a really uh, intriguing uh, description of our seaside. Yeah, I mean, Tenard is a is a, a very interesting, but uh, you know, these days very little known um, figure. And this struck me as sort of rather wonderful because it has that that great, you know, the kind of thing washed up on the beach feel about it which is one of the great things of going to the seaside, going for a walk on the beach, finding an interesting pebble or something like that, which just you pop it in your pocket and take it home. It's the memory of that day. And what Tanard is doing here is he's placing us in a, a world where we're not entirely sure. Are we under the water? Are we just at the water's edge? Is this some, you know, this feels like an anchor that's been cast adrift and it's just left there and we might have encountered it. And, you know, he was very much involved with ideas from the surrealists from the 1920s and 30s. And there's a wonderfully haunting quality about his work. And that always, I think for, for you know, seaside imagery, we often find whether it's painted or whether it's in, in, in the written word, there's often, it's often used as a setting for that slightly, um, that slightly sort of halfway house between, you know, real and unreal and, you know, safe and unsafe, and um, I think you know Tanard has that in this in this work. I mean, it, I I really enjoy hearing you talk about uh, art. You've got a very particular eye, and you do read a painting in a very lovely way. And I think that's what all of our visitors have been responding to when they've gone around the shows. So we're now moving uh, from the seaside, away from the seaside and into the countryside section. And yes. yeah, David Hockney, one of our sort of most famous uh, English artists, but quite an unexpected image from him, I think. Well, that's right. And I think the, I mean, Hockney is, is, Hockney is a very good uh, example of somebody where his public persona and the coverage that uh, that he gets and and has had because i mean you've got to remember that you know hockney was a star in the 60s from the from the early 60s onwards he he made himself a real kind of figure and a, and a face of the art world so you've got that difference between how we perceive him and his art and actually what can be stand behind that which is often a lot more and you know hockney is somebody that we totally associate with colour and anybody who you know went to the Royal Academy show a few years ago or seen any of the recent work or you know seen any of the exhibitions that have been on over the years you think about colour and yet he has always been a very interesting and innovative printmaker and in the late 60s and early 70s he developed an interest in looking at how you illustrate an existing scene or an existing story which is actually a very 19th century way of approaching things, this idea of illustration. And um, this is one which I just thought was a particularly fascinating um, image for what we were doing, because you've got, he's taken a, um, an image which he's drawn in response to one of the stories from the Tales of the Brothers Grimm. Uh, and he's just created this very, very simple idea but it's full of mystery. You've got you you you've got just that sliver of the tree on the left hand side, which makes you feel that perhaps you're just standing at the edge of the wood. You've just emerged from that, and you look across this distance. And he's very carefully, without too many, you know, too many tricks. He's very carefully given you this long sense of distance to this building on the top of the of the hill. And the top, the top of the hill it feels a long way away, but it also feels like somewhere you want to go and see what's there. You, it, it gives you a feeling of pulling you in to take you there. And this, this is where Hockney has a very, he's a very clever and interesting painter. And that's sometimes, you know, lost because you see Hockney as a, a well-known figure and, you know, big colourful pictures. Yeah. No, definitely. Just to say to everyone, if you'd want to comment on anything James has said or want to give us your own um, ideas about how these images uh, speak to you, please do use the chat bar at the bottom of your screen and we'll be able to incorporate uh, your comments into the talk. So on the next slide is another John Piper image, actually, uh, James. I thought you were really interesting as to what made you pick this particular work. Well, this I mean, Piper is a wonderful painter of the countryside. And in 
the period from the 1940s right through to the the end of his life in the 80s um he was somebody who acquired a great public um uh, sort of a great public reputation for the way in which he looked at historical buildings and the church towers and the the, the country houses that he painted they're fascinating examples of how you meld together a very specific and sometimes very traditional subject but with quite a, a loose and rather modernist way of painting these things and when you look closely at Michael's work they feel very detailed but they're not they're actually he, he suggests a lot to you but he also that's kind of antiquarian interest that he had came comes out in some of the works that where he investigates you know less well-known buildings and interesting old things sometimes in a state of decay sometimes a little bit neglected and in those years after the war when i think you know a lot of the buildings had fallen into disuse and there was a reassessment of of of, of what we were doing with our heritage um piper's approach to this is very interesting because he makes this feel around this little churchyard here in this little chapel feel rather dramatic feel a little bit kind of slightly spooky um and of course this when we were looking at these pictures this was at a point where it occurred to me that it was something that was more or less on uh you know uh, unprecedented in in our history that in villages and towns and, and cities around the country there are churches which are hundreds and thousands, in some cases you know nearly a thousand years old and they were all closed and that was something that had never happened before even during even during the world wars the churches had stayed open and that sense that these buildings which were always intended to be at the heart of a community whether they are now or not is a different matter but were intended to be at the heart of a community and were not available to um to people in you know to use them in any any way um and I think Piper is, you know, he's he's somebody who was very good at looking at our past, but actually interpreting it for for for, for, for his yeah. now. I mean, it, you know, that is a really telling image. The idea that that you've highlighted that image, just I think, uh, particularly well described. Quite what an enormous event the mm. pandemic has been, and we're mm. still processing it. Mm. Um, the next image. It, it was actually included in the show that Lara Wardle um, curated for the first year of the exhibition here. Um, Lowry, it was greatly enjoyed by visitors both time round. And uh, again, your your way of reading this image and why you picked it was really fascinating to me. If you could talk a bit more about that. Well, it, I mean, it was an image that I felt I wanted to put into the show, and yet it was not clear. To me, um, and I think we talk, we've, we've talked about this before, it was never clear to us whether, was it a city image, was it a country image, which one was it? And for me, it was important to use it to show how Lowry is somebody we think of very much in connection with the cityscape, with crowded spaces full of people. But there's a great deal of his work, which is actually rather emptier and a little bit more contemplative. and it also reminds us that around the towns and the cities all around Great Britain that have an industrial heritage, many of them are placed within reach of wonderful countryside. And often the thing that connected those towns were things like the canal network or the railway network. And the canal network at the time when this was painted in the 40s was very much in a hinterland you know it had gone long gone past its really useful period as a an artery for industry but at the same time it was still there feeling neglected rather in the sort of the the, the, the backwaters and larry manages to give us that sense of quiet but at the same time the industry that's that's there too and uh, this rather empty little picture but still just those little touches of, of people. He uses red very carefully to move your eye around the image. And he's a more sophisticated painter than people often give him credit for. And this picture for me gave you a very clear insight into something that pops up in Larry's work a lot, which is 
the the shift between two things you know it could be we could have put this into either the country or the city city part of the show yeah yeah so we're going to end our our quick romp through the exhibition and the countryside section with this just lovely image of an english country garden hmm. um well, I mean, I suppose as we as we all remember from last year, um, you know, a garden became, I think, for many people, it became their kind of refuge or or project, uh, and um, uh, that period of enforced being at home for so many people meant that gardens, I think, took on a, a really big importance for, for 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 a lot of people who were fortunate enough to have them, and it kind of connected you back to the way in which the English and the British generally have always felt a garden to be kind of quite a, a significant thing. You know, and not a, a, a large formal garden, but a very small private space that you cultivate. And um, Jones um, was a relatively fragile character. He had quite difficult experiences during the First World War. And a lot of his work in the 20s, there is that sense of um, of a refuge, finding a refuge, getting away from the realities. And this little picture, I think, for me, really did feel that it had those qualities. And that seemed to have a mirror to what was happening to us all at the, um, at the time. Uh, very much so. It, it is really uh, lovely as a picture. So now we're showing you images from the final gallery um, in the exhibition which is cities and actually this ended up being the most crowded um, display uh, of the exhibition perhaps appropriately for a city and uh, James's first painting he wants to talk about is this very crowded uh, painting study for TV. Well I think one of the things about the city pictures was that I think most people who've who visited the exhibition will have noted that they're not actually cityscapes as such. Most of them are things about the life we lead in in a city. And this picture struck me as having a, a rather wonderful little character because it's a picture from the from 1960, which was a time when most people did not own a television. And a television was something where if there was an event that was happening, you know, you, your friends or neighbours could come around and watch watch with you. And this is what's happening here. Roberts is showing as a, a maybe a family group, maybe some neighbours, everybody getting together to watch this boxing match on the television. And that rather um, struck me as being interesting in the light of, again, what was happening to us last year. And in the early days of the, of the, the pandemic and the lockdown, where we, there were those daily briefings that... Um, you really did get a sense that people were watching those to see what happened, what was happening, and to hear what was being um, put forward by the um, those paraded on the screen, should we say? And um, it was a very, it was again, that was a very unusual thing because we've all become attuned over the past sort of decade or so to this idea that we can get our news from a variety of sources, we can look online, we can look on our phones, we can call it up whenever we want and that idea of everybody going back to watching a broadcast at a particular time was rather an interesting and unusual one and um, I just thought this was a, a nice little nice little picture for showing how that can all happen around this little device. Yeah well obviously television did for most of us become mm. you know, a great support uh, yeah. in 2020. So then your next image in a way is very different. It's um, a single portrait of mm. uh, uh, an Afghan gentleman. Mm. And again, it, it speaks about cities, but in sort of quite a left field way. Well, it, I mean, most cities, particularly the, I mean, the larger cities uh, all around uh, Great Britain, they have always had this sense of connection to the rest of the world and going back into the 18th century into the 19th century most large cities whether it be you know glasgow or london or manchester they all had communities and thriving communities sometimes quite small sometimes quite large but from different parts parts of of europe different parts of the world and obviously 
you know, you go back into the 19th century and you're still well in the age of empire. There's, there are connections between Britain and the rest of the world. And those things brought people to, to our cities. And that's, I think, sometimes been a, been a little bit overlooked and perhaps a little bit forgotten about. And when we were selecting the exhibition, I, I felt this was a, a lovely egg, example of how to drop in somebody who you would not have ex necessarily expected to find in London in the 1890s. It was this rather elegant um, Afghan gentleman. We don't know who he is. We've never been able to find out who he, who he is. Um, and sort of inadvertently, he had then acquired a second level of interest because of what's unfolded in Afghanistan over the last uh, over the last few weeks, and how that has been presented and reported and reacted to, um, because it shows you that essentially there is nothing nothing is new really. <laughs> um, you know, we're over a hundred and hundred and twenty years away from when this gentleman was in was in London, and uh, you know, many of those same questions are still floating about. Yeah, I have to say for uh, to anyone who hasn't yet visited the exhibition, this painting, it, when you stand in front of it, is absolutely lovely. And despite those muddy browns, it, um, it yeah, really, it does look a bit flat in the in this photograph, doesn't yeah, it? <laughs> it does really come to life. Yeah. So then, the, the, our final slide and a very different work, almost a uh, hundred years later, is this series of four screen prints from. Patrick Caulfield, which I actually find really difficult to look at. Um, I just wonder why you, why if you could talk about why you thought they were uh, should be in the show. Well, these, I mean, Patrick is Patrick's work has always fascinated me because he has been for years throughout his life able to look at how a very, often a very simple object or subject could be rendered in a way that meant we saw something different about it. And his way of working meant that that was often about light. So you would sometimes see in a, in a work, it wouldn't be the object on a table that you would see with the shadow that it casts. And in this series of prints, which obviously we're seeing all four of them on the screen at the same time, but you know each one is quite a large and individual uh, image. He's done something which artists have done for you know many hundreds of years, and, and Monet did it with his haystacks and the, and the cathedral paintings, of taking the same view and painting it at four different times of day. So we start with morning, we have midday, we have afternoon, and uh, a, a sort of afternoon, evening time, and then a nighttime picture. And what he's done is show us by very, very minimal means, just using three colors in each one, how that sense of where you are changes. So for instance, in the second one, the light outside is what we're drawn to. The last one, it's the light inside that we're drawn to. And because of the, the, the way that the, the windows are done with those blazing bars, it has a slightly claustrophobic feel. So you're very much inside, you're very much kind of in, inside with this happening around you, watching the passage of time. And of course, you know, certainly I found this and I think probably everybody did was that when we were all at home last year all the time and working from home and not going anywhere, not traveling, not ho no holidays, that feeling of being in the same space over long periods of time, day after day, was something that, you know, could be very, very interesting. I mean, sometimes I think it probably could be could be quite depressing. It could be quite jolly, you know, it could, depending on your circumstances, but they um the way in which patrick had looked at how the light and atmosphere changes during the course of the day in the same time in the same place was i thought very interesting and and again you know it seemed to have a resonance with what we were all um seeing and feeling uh, absolutely I, I mean i have to say thank you so much james that was just a very brief kind of romp through the three different galleries your description as to uh, of the paintings and how they spoke to you is immensely revealing um, for me and has really added to uh, my enjoyment of the exhibition which obviously i'm lucky enough to get to see every day and i do really highly recommend um 
to everyone that they come and visit. And um, Lara uh, Wardle, who's the director of the collection, is asking James whether anything new was revealed to you through the process of uh, looking at these works and during the pandemic. Well, I think, I mean, within, whenever you're curating an exhibition, you often start from an image, and that's an image on a page or on a screen. And then the step from that to actually looking at the physical object can reveal a great deal of uh, about how things um, how things change and um, and certainly with the pictures in the exhibition, I did find that spending time looking at those images and then I mean in in, in some cases I was lucky enough to to, to have physically seen the paintings beforehand. Um, that starts to tell you a little bit more about the objects and I mean this is I suppose one of those reasons why it's always best to go and stand in front of the pictures if you can. If you can make it into an exhibition, it's always the, it's always better than looking at the catalogue. <laughs> and um, I found that because I was thinking about how we were sort of reacting to what was ha what was happening, it did make me start to feel that some of, and some of some of the topics and, that were covered in the paintings brought this to the fore. There's a Ruskin spear which. I didn't choose it for us to talk about today because the photograph of it makes it look exceedingly dark mm. and it is but it's also got beautiful light in it and it's of an interior uh, of a pub in Hammersmith in the 1950s and of course this was exactly at the time when not only were the pubs closed but the but the the, the, the pub and hospitality industry in Britain has been having a hard time for a long time and it then raised the idea of the notion of how we view a pub we see it as, as some this rather sort of idealistic i um uh, local asset but then a lot of people never in a, in a village or town or street never go there so the business itself struggles to maintain this idea that we all love the idea that there's a village pub or a town pub or um and that shows you know it did throw these things into contrast so uh James, one final question. Um, did you have any uh, sort of hopes for what people uh, might take away from the exhibition? I think the main thing you want to see is you want to feel that somebody goes along and is able to see something and it springs a few ideas for them. And they don't have to be anything like what I've said. They don't have to be anything. They are your ideas. When you go and view something, it's your ideas that you take away um, and I think it's always you know if something encourages people to go and stand in front of a painting and look at how an artist saw something and to take their own ideas away from it that has to be a good thing and it um, it's perhaps something that we don't often now automatically go to look at something and look we go to something and read the label at the side of it um, and actually the pictures tell you everything that they're about and if you look at the, the paintings that's that, you know that's that that's there and that that whatever your ideas are about and they are legitimate thank you i mean it, it's an incredibly democratic uh, thing to say actually and just to um encourage people anyone our visitors to feel confident of their own ideas and uh, trusting that the the work on display the image will tell you what it's trying to say and that there is no one correct view or reading of the painting yeah absolutely and um i think that is, that's that's an important thing to for people to remember it, it, you know going to see an exhibition should not be a scary thing mm. there isn't a right answer and you know i can come up and i can tell you all sorts of stuff about these things but those a lot of those things are just facts that's not really about how you understand and interpret things in the same way that we could all read the same book and, you know, we'd all have a slightly different feeling about the characters and the plot. Well, it, you've been brilliant, James. Thank you so much for taking time during the pandemic to work with us mainly on Zoom. And if you haven't seen the show, everyone, please do uh, try and make your way here. It's on until the start of November. Our next talk is at the end of October with Jane Wildgoose, 
who's talking about uh, memorial jewellery in the Portland collection. So an before, entire... be, before we before we disappear, um, can I just say hello to somebody who I think is probably as far away as you possibly can be, which is a friend of mine, Sarah, who's in Melbourne in Australia. <laughs> so, uh, so hello, Sarah. <laughs> Well, it's very nice to have you. I think that's the furthest uh, Zoom attendee we've had yet, Sarah. Well done, you. Well, at least it shows what's possible. Then. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much for attending, everybody. I do hope you'll join us next month. And please do come and see either Coast Country, the city, or our next Gerwood exhibition, Kindred Spirits. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, James.